Hi, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Aaron Goldman. Uh, I'm a manager director at General Atlantic and uh, General Atlantic is a global growth equity firm, which I'll tell you a little bit about. And I'm very excited to be here this morning uh, with with Jeremy Allaire, the co-founder and chairman and CEO of Circle. And we're going to talk a bit about stable coins, uh, which has become a more exciting part of the world, uh, despite them maybe supposed to be a more a less exciting part of the world. Uh, and and just about Circle and, and everything that's been going on with them. So so very excited to talk to Jeremy, who's always um, a fascinating person to talk to. So again, I, I'm Aaron Goldman. Uh, General Atlantic is a global growth equity firm. We manage about $80 billion around the world. All of that is invested in growth equity, which means we try and find uh, entrepreneurs around the world. We invest in their companies, and then we try and help them grow their companies faster. We've got about 15 offices around the globe. Um, I co-lead our fintech and financial services investing efforts. I've been at the firm 15 years, and we've invested broadly across traditional capital markets, across payments, across lending, you know, just broad financial services and fintech. And then also more recently, I have been getting more involved in the digital asset space and in and around crypto, which is how I've come to know Jeremy over the past few years. Um, and so with that, maybe Jeremy, uh, that's, that's more than enough you guys want to hear about me. Jeremy, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and, and just an introduction to, to Circle and to USDC and to the Center Consortium, please. Yeah, sure. Nice to see you, Aaron, and, and, and great, great to be doing this event again. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, um, uh, you know, I, I started Circle nine years ago and um, really kind of came at this problem space from a background in building internet software infrastructure products for the prior roughly 20 years. Um, so got very involved in internet platforms, software platforms in the early 90s during the kind of first web.0 web phase, building infrastructure and tools for people to build apps on the internet, which was a very novel concept back in, in the 90s. And, um, and then worked on you know, infrastructure for media on the internet, television on the internet, communications on the internet. Um, and, uh, and then got really excited about um, the possibilities for cryptocurrency um, you know, in, in, uh, in really in 2012, um, and then started, like I said, Circle about nine years ago. And um, really, we've been pursuing since the founding this idea that it would be possible to um, kind of create protocols on the internet for, for money. And, and when we founded the company, we were thinking about, you know, protocols for what we think of as traditional money, which are, you know, what I now call, um, you know, government debt money, um, as opposed to non-sovereign money, like a Bitcoin. And the idea was, if you could have um, a protocol like HTTP was for information and, and SMTP was for email and VOIP is for voice and video, but you could have protocols that could represent fiat currency um, or, or potentially like the safest forms of, of fiat currency um, and enable that to be used on the public internet, that value exchange could become more frictionless, lower cost, more, more global. And, and you know, back when we founded the company in 2013, the idea of smart contracts was, was, um, was around and had been kind of tossed around for, for a little while. Um, but we were very excited, and, and me you know, in particular, about this idea of programmable money. And um, I'd worked on um, you know, kind of virtual machine technology, programming language technology, kind of app infrastructure for, for a better part of my career and, and thought, wow, if you could have a way to represent you know, dollars or euros as like a native type of data on the internet and then protocols to interact and exchange it. And then it was actually programmable with, with um, a kind of trustworthy computing model that would be really, really powerful and could really change how economic activity happens in the world and how financial services eventually could be delivered. Now that was really early and you couldn't do a lot of those things in, in 2013. Um, we experimented with ways to essentially like tunnel dollars and pounds and euros over the Bitcoin network, which was a really bad idea because um, Bitcoin really wasn't designed for, for that. And then finally, um, about five years ago, Ethereum got to a point where you, you could actually kind of build some of these things. And, and we had really um, established a really strong position in the US with regulators. We had gotten licensed to be able to offer um, kind of services that connect the existing banking system in the US to digital currency, to blockchains, and kind of had, had been operating with that for a couple of years. And so we, um, 
we took another crack at solving this problem and and were able to actually build what's now known as USDC. And um, you know, we um, you know, in, instead of building something that was specifically for uh, um, end users, like meaning like a, a product that we would be offering to retail customers, we wanted to kind of offer it as like a, a market infrastructure that anyone could connect to and build on top of, and and then. Um, and, and then rely on a lot of other companies to kind of bring the utility uh, to, to this. And, and so back back in 2018, um, we we announced it in May of 2018. And then prior to launching in September, we put together a partnership with Coinbase, um, where Coinbase became a really strategic launch partner. Um, we put together a consortium around kind of defining um, kind of governance best practices around stable coins. Um, and uh, and then you know launched uh, launched in in the fall and um, obviously USDC has really grown to be um, you know the fourth largest cryptocurrency in the world hopefully soon the third uh, largest in the world um, and um, you know we we've we've tried to kind of build this in a in a trust trustworthy way in a transparent way and and that's really seemed to be important and the the, the market um, really values that and and so we've we've really grown it a lot and and we're now kind of evolving into a lot of other areas. Um, but that's the basic background on on myself and on kind of the journey that we've been on. Great, great. I'm gonna assume that, that the audience here is, is somewhat sophisticated enough that they're familiar with USDC, but, but maybe it's helpful just to talk a little bit about the current state of stablecoin. So if I wanted to represent, if I, if I want to sort of exchange value in dollars, uh, or if I wanted to do something with something that represents, a, let, let, let's start with dollars, uh, there obviously have been a number of, of ways to have done this and, and that landscape has evolved a fair amount. Like how would you describe the current state of stablecoin uh, sitting in, in, in late July, 2021, which I think uh, were we to have had this conversation, uh, which we actually did uh, several months ago, it would have been a very different conversation. So, so talk about what, what's happened and, and where we find ourselves now. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the crypto industry, um, and, and crypto markets have, have gone through a fairly jarring experience. Um, you know, I, th I think um, that that was largely um, kind of starting from just a kind of general de-risking in, in, in all risk assets in all markets, which, which led to, um, you know, some er eroding of, of price and confidence. Um, but, but then, you know, I, I think that in turn kind of led to this, um, kind of death spiral collapse of, of Terra, which I think everyone's pretty familiar with at this point. And, and that was, um, I think, very important because there are a lot of people who sort of um, believed that a subsidized uh, kind of interest rate protocol uh, could, could, could you know, bring a stable coin into existence um, in a sustainable way. And, and I think- And Jeremy, Jeremy, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you here because it's, it's instead of calling Terra an ecosystem an algorithmic stable coin, which I think what most people call it, you called it a subsidized interest rate protocol. So well, maybe so, I, is that yeah. intentional or you were making a distinction? Well, so so I mean, very specifically, Anchor Protocol, um, w which was really the growth driver for Terra UST, um, really the, the reason why people would create UST was so that they could uh, deposit it into Anchor Protocol, which was essentially a subsidized yield. Um, it was subsidized using you know, the sale of Luna tokens. And so as long as Luna was going up, and as long as they were subsidizing that, uh, th there was a reason for that to exist. But when the price of Luna went down or when it was clear that the subsidies were gonna run out, you know, people went for the door and then that led to this death spiral. So I, I really, I really refer to, while the, the concept of an algorithmic stablecoin is there, and there was obviously this ARB mechanism that, that tried to keep the price in line, fundamentally, in my view, this was just a giant effort to kind of subsidize something into existence with the hope that it would create boots, bootstrapping effects that could be sustainable. But no, nonetheless, the, that total collapse, um, you know, has cascaded uh, through the entire market. Um, there were, you know, I think what we thought were highly intelligent people who took really significant long and leveraged positions on this who were destroyed, that then ripped holes through the balance sheets of a lot of other institutional participants. There were firms who uh, were, you know, purportedly lending to quote unquote high quality institutional borrowers, but who were actually lending to, um, you know, borrowers who basically had no real risk management and, and were or committing fraud in many cases, and that just blew a hole through a, a lot of uh, a lot of firms, and has caused you know at least 
at least five or six known bankruptcies. There's probably 10 or 15 more sitting out there, um, just maybe smaller firms or, or, or funds that are just dead. Um, so that's been awful. Um, so that's sort of, you know, I think um, in some ways the predictable consequence of, of, of some of the risks that were being taken um, around Terra. Now, I think, um, so yes, the world has changed. And, and I think um, what's happened is there's just a lot more attention being paid to risk and you know what is a stable coin? What are reserves? Uh, what is actually going on? You know where where does risk exist? And uh, you, you know uh, as 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 a trader who I know who I uh, who used to work with me made a tweet. He was joking that um, you know just like six months ago or even three months ago, people were like you know you know how do I get more like like you know, cr cr crazy like token emission yields from some new like food farming yield protocol. And that was like considered completely safe and sane to, you know, trying to understand like what the serial numbers were on the treasury bonds that back a stable coin to make sure that they felt comfortable that that the risk was actually low. I mean, literally the same people, you know, three months ago are, you know, talking about like food farming in like crazy unknown, like hackable DeFi protocols. And, and then all of a sudden are worried about like, do you really really have the T-bills. So, I mean, really the, the, the environment has changed massively. And so it's been a flight to quality and a flight to safety. And that's been, I think, really positive for, for USDC. And we've seen a huge amount of change in the market where everything from exchanges and OTC desks and 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 market makers and, and just average users just really thinking about, hey, what, you know, what does this really mean? Um, what is a real, you know, stable coin? And that's brought more government attention as well. And we're seeing, you know, a, a lot of um, new stable coin policies being introduced uh, in the EU, in the UK. We're going to see major proposals uh, probably tomorrow or, uh, or early next week in Congress, which are really positive. Um, I, I'm very encouraged by that. So that's happening. And I think there's going to be more clarity around, um, you know, what is, a legitimate stable coin as a financial instrument that could be used in 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 the broader economy and 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 what are things that are represent potentially unacceptable risks and 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 Jeremy every time uh, and this is sort of a cycle that we've seen play out uh, I would say have I've seen play out in financial services now for for better longer than two decades you know you have these um, events then you know sort of the warm buff expression the tide goes out you see who's not wearing pants trousers. Um, and then the regulators come in and the regulators um, make all kinds of rules, uh, some of which are, are often well intentioned and well thought out, some of which, you know, can be less well intentioned and less well thought out. How do you see the regulation, because just because you just touched on it, evolving, I guess, in the U.S., in Europe, in Asia, uh, obviously in the U.S. there's been some different views in terms of who has to hold the reserves, what kind of reserves can be held. Is that is that, is that where you think the regulation drives towards and and does that um, does the regulation bring more of this into the, the traditional banking systems of a number of these geographies or is that just not the solution? Well, so the interesting thing is that um, you know a lot of thinking was really spurred on around this topic you know really starting several years ago when when Facebook announced the Libra initiative that sort of forced a lot of regulators to really think about this and and a lot of progress was actually you know being made in 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 congress and and in and in the administration just you know starting last year and then into the fall when the presidential working group issued its report on stablecoin policy and so there was a lot of work and actually even in the couple of months prior to the the terra blow up um you know, we were very involved in a lot of of meaningful discussions in congress about you know uh, stablecoin policy I think what's what's happening is that um, in in every major financial market, the U.S., U.K., you know, Europe, um, I expect we'll see similar things in Singapore as well. It's the prudential banking and payments regulators who are really coming in um, to to uh, to define how to how to regulate this. And so, in some ways, yes, it is coming into the 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 banking system regulators. Now that's already been the case to some degree for 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 crypto. Um, a lot of payment service acts were amended to accommodate crypto tokens and um, and and some of the activity there. Um, but 
what I think, uh, I think, what I think we're seeing, and we, we've seen this in the new laws passed in, in the EU, we'll supposedly mm -hmm. see the, the UK government proposal potentially even tomorrow as well. So these are all happening kind of simultaneously. Uh, but, but in the US, I think what we'll see is a requirement for stablecoin issuers to essentially register um, with the federal government, um, potentially with the Federal Reserve directly, um, to have a charter for stablecoin issuing, dollar stablecoin issuing, um, that would be available to both bank and non-bank uh, issuers, but it would still require a, a kind of Federal Reserve registration uh, and, and supervision. Um, and defining things like liquidity requirements, reserve requirements, asset mix, um, really important you know, pieces there, but, but very likely also some definitions around the fundamental kind of operational uh, risks and risk management that, that are needed for this. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think we'll see other th things like, um, you know, um, that that these these products um, are designed with interoperability in mind uh, so that there's, you know, open competition. And um, I, I think that's a theme that we're hearing in, in other places in the world as well. I think that's a really important concept. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think, that's that's the essence of it, and and I think that the it's likely that and some of this has been reported already. So I'm not I'm not um, you know I'm, I'm not saying anything that's not already been reported. But you know I think um, the idea that only insured depository institutions would be involved in this is is really not the case. And I think what's happened is actually um, regulators have come to understand that deposit insurance doesn't make any sense for stable coins because you're not if you're in a full reserve model where you're holding essentially you know, cash at the Fed and and short duration U.S. government treasury bonds, there's no risk taking, right? You're you're not, you know, you're not rehypothecating money. You're not doing fractional reserve banking and, and things like deposit insurance are designed for insurance on the fact that banks lend your money out, <laughs> but there's no lending here. So I, I think that's what we're seeing. And, and, I, and I'm and i very encouraged. And I think that um, having that kind of, of, of regulatory framework will, will allow um, you know, households, um, corporations, and other financial institutions to really understand what are what are these digital currencies? How can I, you know, utilize them? Where do they fit in the overall financial market infrastructure? And once you have that, then actually, I believe that that's when these can grow into uh, a, a, a you know a really really massive thing. I mean, they're they're significant now, but I think uh, could grow much more more significantly. And Jeremy, just a question on something you said there, which is like, clearly the circle model has been 100% collateralized, no rehabilitation, no lending, very a lot of transparency, which I think uh, especially uh, uh, like everything else for a little while there was perhaps out of vogue, but more recently, I think people have, have flown to quality. In the comments you just made about deposit insurance, it seems like your view of the future is that continues. So what ends up being the revenue model for, for the stable coin if it's in a world where basically you have to really segregate those funds and you can't do other things with them? Um, is it that you earn yield and capture it? Is the yield get shared? How, how do you think about what, what the what the business model becomes then for stable? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think um, th th there are many, many things um, for, for this space. I think um, and the, the way we think about this as a circle is, we think about the, the stablecoin market infrastructure that we operate as a platform that other people can build on top of. And we think of, you know, kind of protocols and, and infrastructure as something people can build on. And platforms are 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 are, are really platforms when they're the people who build on top of them actually capture a lot of the value, right? That 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 you know the, there's sort of a, a utility that you're providing and that utility you know, you, you do get compensated for operating that utility, but hopefully all the people that build on top of that utility actually generate most of the economic value. You know, maybe it's 80% of the value or what have you. And, and, and even we see that today with USDC. I mean, for, 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 uh, you know, for a very long time, we, we were not monetizing USDC directly much at all. Um, and, you know, tons of, you know, hundreds of projects were building incredible things uh, on top of it. And it became a really important, reliable, trusted, dollar, you know, settlement infrastructure on the internet. And, and that's created a lot of value for a lot of, of firms and people too. Um, now we're monetizing, obviously, um, as interest rates have risen, um, we, we do, we do monetize uh, there. And um, one could, 
you know, argue about what what a real nominal or what a real interest rate is going to be over time and what does that look like. Um, there's there's very likely a period globally of rising interest rates, but that should presumably moderate over time into a more normal interest rate environment. Um, so you know, there's certainly monetization as as that grows, but also um, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity for firms like Circle to provide a broader array of of uh, you know transaction based and platform services that make it easy for people to integrate this into a lot of other kinds of of product services and applications and we're really betting on that being significant over time and and that's something we can provide but also lots of other of, of firms can can provide that as well so it'd be a kind of open competitive playing field around those kind of value added uh, services but um, we, we think we are well positioned to to offer a lot of those um, and 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 provide value, and I think you know we're we're interested in seeing more stable coins in the market. So we've recently uh, launched Eurocoin, um, that's just getting off the ground. We're very excited about uh, crypto-based FX, both CFI and DeFi, and and ultimately getting to a point where real-world commerce, commercial finance, international transactions can be supported with really robust on-chain, um, you know, uh, 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 digital currencies. Listen, because you brought it up, just just touch briefly on on Eurocoin and the genesis of it, and and um, do you see the same applications for it as you've seen for USDC or different applications? I just I, I think it's, it's interesting for people to hear a bit more about about that. And I I obviously saw the launch and, and was excited about it. Yeah, so it, it's sort of always been a question of of when, not if, more. Um, fiat currency stable coins would would uh, would would come about, and and there have been attempts at a lot of different fiat currency stable coins um, around the world, and and th there there's a lot more interest in that right now. Some of that has to do with the success of dollar stable coins and what people have seen, but I think it's also a, a market evolution. The the kind of what I describe as the bootstrap use case for dollar stable coins was really as a dollar settlement infrastructure in the digital asset markets themselves. That's sort of where the use case came from. And, and in that case, you really only needed dollars because these are 24 seven global markets. They trade in dollars, they price in dollars, quote in dollars, everyone wants to settle in dollars. And, and so that kind of made sense. Now, what we're seeing is as blockchains mature, um, we're starting to see that there are more and more applications that are international payments applications um, there are more and more corporations that are looking at how they can apply this. And so the demand for other currencies is starting to grow. We actually think um, very one of the most exciting new areas is actually FX itself. And so one of the really powerful things about stable coins is they settle nearly instantly um, and they can operate on, on exchanges, whether centralized or decentralized, that run continuously. And so you can have continuous price discovery, continuous settlement, um, and you you now have obviously uh, very sophisticated uh, financial market primitives like options and derivatives and other things, both in centralized and decentralized exchanges. And so you really actually have the building blocks for, uh, uh, in some ways, a superior FX market to what we have in the TradFi space. And so I think um, we will see growth in what I call broadly kind of crypto FX, um, and, and we're excited to see that. And in many ways, kind of the, the the vision of of you know corporations and businesses and people being able to um, conduct commerce over the internet more natively more digitally it really requires that the, that building block of really robust um, FX uh, on-chain FX be in place you kind of need that as a as a precondition in some ways to the other mm -hmm. commerce applications and so sort of a gradual building up of that market infrastructure and euro is obviously the you know second most traded currency in the world. And, and, and ultimately, when you think about commerce and trade, it, it plays a very big role. And so that really is um, the reason why we, we chose to, uh, to focus on that as the next currency. Great. And, and, and Jeremy, maybe you touch a bit about it broadly about what's going on in lending earlier, but um, you know, there's been some, some sort of FUD, as it were, around Circle, and, and you guys had a small lending business. What's the state of, of your lending business and what's the state of sort of crypto lending you think going forward here? Yeah, so we've been publishing a, a, a broad series of what we call our trust and transparency blog posts uh, from uh, from 
our policy side of the house, our CFO and others. And so there's just, there's a lot of information that's there. Um, we um, earlier this year launched a self-service uh, crypto uh, based lending product, uh, Circle Yield. Um, that has operated flawlessly throughout this period. Uh, we've had no no losses, no failed uh, collateral calls, uh, and and it's worked seamlessly for customers. So we're really happy with that. And and there's a reason, which is that we designed it uh, in a very different way than other products in the market. The the first was that we chose to uh, focus on finding a regulator who would supervise us. That would supervise our collateral requirements. That would supervise our overall risk management and the depth of the risk management that we needed to perform downstream on, on borrowers, uh, the underwriting standards, uh, putting capital aside against the product. Um, so we chose to operate in a regulated way when no one else did. Uh, the second is that um, you know we, we only offered the product as a security. It is a security, you're purchasing a security um, and only to accredited businesses. So not even accredited, individuals, but accredited businesses. So very sophisticated kind of purchasers. Um, and, um, and you know, we built a, a, a model which was um, an over collateralized uh, product. So relatively small in scale, as we publicly disclosed, um, you know, at, at the time when we when we shared our update, there were there was less than $300 million of, of, uh, of loans outstanding, um, but it's it's done well. Now, I think more broadly, so much of the market um, was driven by these kind of retail platforms that were, uh, you know, basically offering illegal securities uh, to uh, unaccredited investors um, who were uh, not disclosing really much of anything of, of what their fundamental risk management was um, and who were now we're learning, taking extraordinary uh, uh, levels of risk, uh, not just in terms of their, their, their lack of, of, uh, of significant underwriting standards, but that they were actually you know, essentially executing extremely high risk investment strategies. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, that's, that's been, there, there's a reason why you have securities registrations. Um, there's a reason why you have SEC qualification for uh, retail investment products. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're seeing people learn the hard way. Um, and the SEC was trying to get out ahead of that um, with, uh, you know, stopping some of these companies. Uh, but um, unfortunately it was too late. Great. And then I guess uh, one final question, because uh, we're about to wrap up. Uh, at least current coin market cap, Tether still has a bigger market cap than USDC. Do you anticipate the flipping happening in 2022 when USDC becomes bigger than Tether? You know, I I, I definitely expect USDC to be the largest dollar scale stable coin in the world, um, and, and hopefully pretty soon. Uh, we certainly continue to grow. Um, faster than 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 others, and um, and others have declined actually a lot. Um, so we would expect. So um, I think you know what I often say is um, you know we're, we're we're focused on I think a bigger market. Um, the, the the total addressable market is sort of more broadly what happens in in commercial finance and in in M two money and and we're trying to get this to a place where you know this is utilized by uh, by mainstream corporations and. And households and financial institutions and is properly regulated. Um, we think that's how it gets to be a lot larger. And there's always going to be a market for sort of offshore shadow banking. Um, uh, and uh, and I think that market is sort of constrained in size. Um, and, uh, and it's going to have a more and more and more difficult time as, as regulators put a, a, a stronger perimeter up around uh, what's acceptable in their markets. Great. Well, listen, thank you so much for doing this, Jeremy. I know you're in Singapore. I'm in uh... Poland, thanks everyone for listening for wherever around the world they are. And uh, can I say have a nice weekend yet? It's it's Thursday in the summer. Almost. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank Take you. care, all. Thank you. Bye-bye.